So welcome you to today's lecture. Uh, if anyone of you have any questions, uh, you may ask now. Any questions from the previous lecture or any of the doubts which may be bothering you? So how are you finding the course? Because a lot of this stuff you have already done at your bachelor's level. So I hope it's not too easy for you people, right? How are you finding the course? Any feedback anyone would like to give? Is it getting too easy? Because a lot of these things you have already done at bachelor's level. Moderate. Yeah. Not that moderate. It's a moderate, right? Neither easy nor difficult. Okay, great. But uh, the way you studied at bachelor's level and the way you are studying now, do you find some difference? Yes, sir. So, in what sense you see the difference? Some new things are getting introduced. Okay, and you get more insight into what sufficiency is, how it is related to statistics in terms of data science, how uh, that, that also I hope you are able to get a philosophical feel of what sufficiency, minimal sufficiency, ancillary, all these things mean, right? They all are interrelated and there's a very philosophical uh, connection between them. Okay, any, does anyone has any question? Sir, uh, from the last lecture. Right. Uh, can you please uh, share the screen? What is the, uh, okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. Let me. Yeah, where? Yes, sir, uh, in the last page. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. How to go about the part D? Part? D. I mean, the last problem. Right. Right. So you have to look at the uh, uh, protein mass function of this. So you see, one way is here, Rao Black Blackwellison theorem can help very easily because I can get a one unbiased estimator. Let me see. So I can get, sorry, I can get one unbiased estimator. Let me see as delta one ux as one, if x one is x, zero otherwise. Here is small x is a fixed quantity. Fix small x, right? Then what is expected value of uh, delta one u? It is one times probability x equal to x, which is p theta x. Is that okay? Yes. So it is an unbiased estimator. Now, using this, I can get a UMV because I can condition it with t and I can get the UMV. So uh, the UMV is of p theta x is expected value of delta one u x given t, right? So just I need to find out, let me call this as eta t. So I need to find out what eta t is. Eta t is nothing but expected value of delta one u x given t is equal to t, which is probability that, what is delta one u x? Probability x one is equal to x. So probability x one is equal to x given t is equal to t which is same as probability that x1 is equal to x, t is equal to t, divided by probability t is equal to t. All right, probability t is equal to t, you already have a mass, probability mass function, right? Which is this, is that okay? Yes, sir. 
So now you just need to find out what is this. So this is same as probability x1 is equal to x. And t summation i is equal to 1 to n, xi is same as t. And let me call this as star. Star is probability t is equal to t, which you already know. Now this is same as probability x1 is equal to x. And here it becomes summation i is equal to 2 to n, xi is equal to t minus x. Is that OK? Yes, sir. Divided by star. Now x1 and x2 to xn are independent. So this becomes probability x1 is equal to x. Probability that summation i is equal to 1 to n minus 1. xi is equal to t minus x divided by star. Star is probability t is equal to t, which is this. Right? Now note that x1 is equal to x, you already know. right? Because probability mass function of x1 is given from the family star. Right? Now this, uh, the second one, is exactly the same as t, except that in place of n, you have here n minus 1, right? In this case, it is x1 plus x2 to xn minus 1. So it is a distribution of x2 to xn minus 1, which is same as distribution of x1 to xn, with n getting replaced by n minus 1. So it would be a t minus x, n, theta to power t minus x, c theta to power n, and you can just calculate that. Is that clear? So Does can that... you please reiterate the last line? Uh, what one? This is OK? The, uh, is that... I mean, uh, this, the distribution of uh, summation uh, xi, i goes from uh, 2 to n. Right. Probability summation i is equal to 2 to n xi is equal to t minus x, right? Now note that this is same as distribution of sum of n iid random variables from Poisson, n minus 1 pi iid. But sum of n independent random variables from power series is this. So the distribution would be exactly same, except that n gets replaced by n minus 1. Is that OK? OK, sir. Right. So you get that as a t n minus 1. So what does that become? This becomes a t minus x n minus 1. And then what was over here? Theta to power t. So theta to power t minus x divided by c theta to power n minus 1. Is that OK? And you will see that when you calculate this, x1 is equal to x and all that you put, it is not going to depend on theta. It could be some quantity. Is that clear? Yes, sir, clear. OK. Because you see, uh, x2 to xn, first of all, note that x2 to xn has the same distribution as x1 to xn minus 1. Is that OK or not? Because they are ID. Yes, sir. So that means if you sum them, summation i is equal to 2 to n xi would have the same distribution as summation i is equal to 1 to n minus 1 xi, right? Sum of all this. But this is same as the only difference between this and t is in place of n, you have n minus 1. That's all. OK, I hope it clarifies your doubt. Yes, you're convinced. OK. Anything else uh, anybody has? OK, not, if not, uh, I leave this also as an exercise. Uh, x is multinomial n, theta 1, theta 2, theta k. Summation theta is 1, so that means these all are dependent random variables. Anyway, they would be dependent random variables. Summation i is equal to 1 to k xi, that means would be how much? Can anyone tell? Because sum of all theta is 1. So what would be summation i is equal to 1 to k xi? Anyone? It has to be n, right? Yes, sir. Right. So, uh, what is the variance? Uh, what is x, uh, xi? I know that xi is binomial and theta i, right? In, if because if x1, x2, xk has a multinomial, then xi has binomial and theta i. So, expected value of xi would be n theta. I. So, expected value of xi upon n is theta i. But before that, what is the complete sufficient statistics over here? So, if you look at f theta of x1, x2, xk, which is factorial n by factorial x1, factorial xk. 
theta 1 to power x1, theta 2 to power x2, theta k minus 1 to power xk minus 1, and theta k to power xk. Can anyone tell what would be the uh, complete sufficient statistic in this case? Can anyone tell what would be the su complete sufficient statistic? Now note that if a, I hear I a try order statistic, uh, not exactly that. So let us try to see what happens over here. When I try to put here, uh, order statistic would not be because theta one cannot be separated from x one. These thetas are not same. So first of all, let us try to use the exponential result, right? So this would be h x. So I can call this as, let us say hx into e to power x1 log theta1 plus x2 log theta2 plus xk minus 1 log theta k minus 1 plus xk log theta k. It is of that exponential form. So this x1, x2, xk would be the complete sufficient statistics provided log theta 1, log theta 2, and log theta k contain a k-dimensional rectangle. But log theta 1, log theta 2, log theta k cannot contain a k-dimensional rectangle because their sum is 1. So log of theta k is same as log of psi. So they are not independent. So to use that result, I have to further simplify this. So what I do is I write down this as factorial n, factorial x1, factorial xk minus 1. And then this factorial xk, I write down as n minus x1 minus x2, n minus i is equal to 1 to k minus 1, xi, because their total sum has to be 1. e to power x1 log theta 1 plus xk minus 1 log theta k minus 1 plus xk log of theta k I write down as 1 minus summation i is equal to 1 to k minus 1 theta i, right? And then this e to power xk, uh, yeah, e to power log uh, of uh, right e to the power xk log 1 minus m is equal to 1 to k minus 1 theta. Is that okay? Now uh, I have this as eta 1, eta 2, and still this doesn't contain k minus 1 rectangle. So what would be this quantity? Can you write down this? Uh, what would be complete sufficient? Anyone can tell now? You see, if if you try to do over here, xk also can be written as this xk. Let me just make a small this xk here because it's also same as n minus summation x i. Plus n minus summation i is equal to 1 to k minus 1 xi, right? And log of 1 minus summation i is equal to 1 to k minus 1 theta. Right? Now, these xi's are coming, each of them. So they get combined with this, right? So you get k minus 1. So what is the complete sufficient statistic in this case? Can anyone tell now? Yes? See, so there exponential is one x2 x k minus 1 is sufficient. It is complete also, right, by that exponential result, right? Because it will contain a k minus 1 rectangle. Log oh, theta okay. 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 Is that OK? 
these exercises you can combine with this. Is that okay? You see, xi, you will get a x1, for example, log of theta 1 minus log of this which is same as log of theta 1 divided by 1 minus summation i is equal to 1 to k minus 1, this thing. In fact, so each of x k minus 1 can be combined. So you get eta 1, which is log of theta 1 upon 1 minus summation theta i k, log of theta 2 upon all that. So they contain a k-dimensional rectangle. So x1 has to x k minus 1 is complete sufficient. Right? And what is expected value of x i? In fact, this and this are one to one function, right? x1, x2, xk minus 1, and x1 to xk are 1 to 1 function. Why? Anyone? x1 to xk minus 1, and x1, x2, xk minus 1, and xk are 1 to 1 function. Why? Because their sum is n. So if you know n minus 1, you know, you know the remaining one, right? So for example, if you know x1, x2, xk minus 1, you know this because x1, x2, xk minus 1, anyway, you know, and this xk you know is nothing but n minus of all this. If you know this, anyway, you know this. So both are complete sufficient, right? The x1, x2, xk minus 1 or x1, x2, xk minus 1 and xk. Both are complete sufficient. Expect, and xi is binomial n theta i. So expected value of xi is n theta i. So expected value of xi upon n is theta i. So this is the UMV. This is a function of a complete sufficient. Unbiased for theta i. So it is UMV for theta i. Would anyone give me a hint how to find the UMV of theta i, theta j? Anyone? How to find the uh, theta i, theta j? So it looks like I should consider xi into xj, expected value of xi into xj. But finding expected value of, can anyone tell me how to find expected value of xi into xj? Because that looks like should be some constant time theta i, theta j, because xi corresponds to theta i xj corresponds to theta j. So it will be some constant time theta i theta j. That is what my intuition suggests. But I want to verify my intuition. So how to calculate expected value of xi xj for i not equal to j? Anyone? Can anyone tell? Does anyone know how to evaluate expected value of xi into xj in the multinomial case? So covariance of xi xj plus expectation of xi into expectation of xj. That is okay, but how do you then calculate covariance of xi xj? So covariance is n into theta i theta j. n times? n times. Or minus n times? Yes, sir. minus n times, yes. Sir. yes. Right. So how do you calculate this? Uh -oh. From MGF. Uh, MGF, you can do it. So if you know it, I don't have to do anything. So you know that, already know that. This is same as minus n times theta i theta j. For i not equal to j. The expected value of xi xj by n minus xi, expected value minus xi xj by n is nothing but theta i theta j. So UMV for theta i theta j is minus of xi xj by n. Okay. So that completes this problem. Now let's talk about a few variance inequalities. And first let us motivate why we need these inequalities. So let VL theta naught be the variance of locally minimum variance and bias estimated at theta naught. Now when UMV does not exist, that VL theta can be used as a benchmark for evaluating the performance of any unbiased estimator. Because I type, because these are the best possible variance you can have. Because it is the variance of the locally minimum variance unbiased estimator at theta naught. So if UMV does not exist for various theta, I compare the variance of a given estimator with this benchmark. And that would give us an idea that how good a given estimator is. But unfortunately, in most of the situations, it is not easy to calculate what would be VL theta naught. That means what would be the variance of a locally minimum variance and bias estimator. So unfortunately, VL theta is generally difficult to evaluate. So thus, when something is difficult to evaluate, it's better to get some approximation of this. And the best type of approximations which are available to one are the inequalities. So the question is, can I have some kind of inequality for 
the variance of a locally minimum variance and bias estimator. Now note that this uh, covariance inequality may turn out to be very handy because I know that covariance of any estimated data and any function psi would always be less than or equal to square root of variance of data into variance of psi. Now, if I use this inequality, this gives me variance of data would always be greater than or equal to covariance of data psi whole square divided by variance of psi, provided the movements exist. This gives an inequality, but this inequality is not going to be useful for me. Why? Because I want a bound on variance of data, which is independent of data. But here, the right-hand side itself depends on a data. So this inequality does not seem to be of that use because I would like to have an inequality which gives me variance of data for any data. So this quantity would change with data. So I should get an inequality which is right-hand side is independent of data so that I can say that if you look at variance of any data, it would be greater than or equal to this quantity, which does not depend on data. So the above inequality is not useful for our purposes as the right-hand side also involves data. However, if my psi is chosen so that covariance of data psi depends on data only through its expected value, because I want to compare the variances of all unbiased images. So the only thing common between them is they are all unbiased. So that means their expected value is g theta, if I'm estimating g theta. So if I can choose psi, says that this covariance of data psi depends on data only through its expected value, then my job would be done. Then I can get a right-hand side inequality which does not depend on data. It depends on data only through it's expected value. So that means as long as the expected values of two data are same, the inequality would hold. So however, when co covariance of data psi depends on data only through the expected value, A does provide a lower bound for the variance of all unbiased estimators of G theta. So I try to look at what is the condition under which, what is the condition on psi so that covariance of data psi depends on data only through its expected value. So the next result is about that. A necessary and sufficient condition, so it is a if and only if condition, so a necessary and sufficient condition for covariance of data psi to depend on data only through its expected value is that the covariance between psi and any unbiased estimator should be zero. Any unbiased estimator of zero should be zero. So if my psi is such that covariance of the psi with any unbiased estimator of zero is zero, then this quantity covariance of delta psi would depend on delta only through its expected value. Call of all such is u such that effectively if you are seeing. So let us try to see that. So suppose covariance of psi and u is zero for every u belonging to u and for every theta belonging to theta. Then I have to what I have to show? I have to show that this covariance of delta psi depends on delta only through its expected value. So that means if I have two deltas whose expected value is same, then the covariance of delta should be same with psi. So let delta one and delta two be unbiased estimators. So that means their expected value is g theta. Then I have to show that covariance delta one psi is same as covariance delta two psi. Now, if this is happening, then I know that delta one minus delta two belongs, is an unbiased estimator of zero. And therefore, covariance of psi and delta one minus delta two would be zero, because that is what given to me. 
This is equivalent to saying that covariance of delta, covariance of psi with delta one would be same as covariance of psi with delta two. Or in other words, covariance of psi delta depends on delta only through the common thing which they have is their expected value. Their expected value is same, which is same as g. Now let's look at the converse part. Now conversely, suppose that for every theta belonging to theta, covariance of delta psi depends on delta only through its expected value. Then what I have to show? I have to show that then covariance of psi and u would be zero for any unbiased emitter u of zero. So let us consider any unbiased emitter of zero and so that covariance of psi and u is zero. Then I know that expected value of delta would be same as expected value of delta plus u is same as g theta. And therefore, covariance of delta psi would be same as covariance of delta plus u psi, because you're, you're given that covariance of delta psi depends on delta only through their expected value. So if delta and delta plus u have the same expected value, so their covariance with psi would be the same. But this is same as covariance of delta psi plus covariance of u psi. And covariance of delta psi gets canceled both of both the sides. So it, is same as covariance of u psi is zero. So the above theorem suggests that this cauchy schwarz inequality can be useful if I choose psi, says that covariance of psi and u is zero for every unbiased emitter u of zero. So the next theorem exploits that fact, which is called the Hammersley-Chapman Robbins inequality, it is a much more general inequality than the Kramer law inequality. So let us try to see, suppose that X has a PDF or PMF F theta, where theta belonging to theta is unknown. Suppose A is the set of all those X, such that F theta X is positive, is independent of theta belonging to theta. So that means the set where my density is positive does not depend on theta. Right? The set where density is positive does not depend on theta. So for example, uniform zero theta is not covered over here. So that is a part of assumption. Exponential theta one is not compared, covered over here because there the range is x greater than theta. Uniform zero theta range is x between zero to theta. So all those are distributions are not covered over here. So suppose that A is the set of all those x's such that f theta x is positive and this set does not depend on theta. Then if I look at any theta belonging to theta, and I define B theta as collection of all those de delta in this parameter space, says that T theta plus delta belong to theta, and G theta is different from G theta plus delta. Right? Let delta be any unbiased emitter of G theta, that means absolute delta is same as G theta then variance of delta would always be greater than or equal to supremum over this set, delta belonging to B theta, of G delta plus theta minus G theta whole square, divided by expected value of F theta plus delta X upon F theta X minus whole square. Now we'll see later that raw Kramer inequality I can get from this as a particular case. So I fix theta belonging to theta, and delta says that theta plus delta belongs to theta. I define psi delta x theta to be f theta plus delta x upon f theta x minus one, because I'm trying to choose this psi so that covariance of this with any unbiased emitter of zero is zero. And then I can take a covariance of this with delta and that will give me an inequality. The idea is very simple. So I have been able to identify one function psi, which is like this, and I'll show that covariance of this psi with any unbiased emitter of u is zero. So that means it satisfies the condition of last lemma. And if it satisfies the condition of last lemma, then this right-hand side covariance does not depend on delta as long as expected value of delta is same. So I can use then this inequality to get a bound. And that is what exactly I'm going to do now. 
So I try to see first what is expected value of this quantity. This is same as integral of f theta delta x by f theta x minus one. Since I'm taking the expectation under theta, I'll have to get a density under theta over here. I do this f theta x, f theta x gets cancelled minus f theta x. But f theta is a density for any theta, and my theta plus delta is in the parameter space. So this is a density. So its integral would be one. Theta is also in the parameter space. So this integral would also be one. So one minus one is zero. So expected value of psi delta x theta is zero. I have to show that covariance of psi delta x theta and ux is zero. But since expected value of this is zero, this would be same as expected value of psi delta x theta into ux, which is same as psi delta x theta I have chosen as f theta delta x by f theta x, so f theta delta x by f theta x minus one into ux, since I'm taking expected value at f theta, so f at theta, so f theta x dx. This becomes ux f theta delta x dx minus integral over ux f theta x. But u is unbiased for zero, so that means expected value of u would be zero for every theta. Since theta plus delta is in a parameter space, so it is expected value of u under theta plus delta. This is expected value of u under theta, but u is unbiased for zero, so expected value of u would be zero, whatever theta may be. Since this is in a parameter space, this would be zero, this would be zero, and this would be zero. So it looks like this co choice of psi will give me a bound. So I look at covariance of delta x and psi delta x theta, which is expected value of delta x and psi delta x theta, which is same as delta x. Psi delta x theta is f theta delta x by f theta x minus one. This goes over here, f theta x, f theta gets canceled. So that is integral over delta x, f theta plus delta x which I'm calling as g theta plus delta minus integral over delta x, f theta x, I'm calling that as a g theta. I get variance of delta would be getting equal to covariance of delta psi delta divided by variance of psi delta. But covariance of delta psi delta is same as g theta plus delta minus g theta whole square divided by variance of uh, psi delta. Expected value of psi delta we have shown is zero. So variance of psi delta would be expected value of psi delta square, which would be expected value of this square. And this is what is written over here. Expected value of f theta delta x upon f theta x minus one whole square. Let us see what my inequality said. It said exactly this. So my variance of delta would always be greater than or equal to this quantity. Here the assumption was that my delta has been chosen so that for theta belonging to capital theta, delta, theta plus delta should be different from this because then only you can get a non-trivial inequality. So this inequality holds for all delta such that g theta plus delta is not equal to g theta and theta plus delta belongs to parameter space. So I can take the supremum because it holds for all such delta. So it would hold for a supremum of all those things. So it would happen is greater than or equal to supremum of delta because this is less than or equal to this quantity. If something is less than or equal to something for all delta, it would be less than or equal to supremum of this would be less than or equal to this. Right? So this same as supremum over delta belonging to B theta and B theta is such that they are different and theta plus delta belongs to the parameter space. That is how we are defined. Theta plus delta belongs to parameter space and g theta is different from g theta plus delta. So this proves the inequality. But here, this choice of delta sometimes can be tricky. So I try to further simplify this bound in certain situations especially when certain assumptions are satisfied. So I, for that, I state some regularity conditions. The first regularity condition says my theta is an open interval. It can be finite. 
It can be infinite or it could be semi-infinite. The distributions F theta have the common support so that the set where density are positive is independent of theta. So my parameter space is an open set. Set where density is positive does not depend on theta. And for any x belonging to A and theta belonging to theta, the derivative F theta prime x, which is the derivative with respect to theta, exists. And integral over F theta x dx, which is one, can be differentiated under the integral sign. So that means d by d theta f theta x dx is zero. So if I take that inside, that should be allowed. Now, if you see the Lehmann's book, these all regularity conditions would always be satisfied in the case of exponential distribution, exponential families of distribution. So Poisson, Poisson binomial, negative binomial, binom uh, uh, normal, gamma, everywhere these conditions would be satisfied. Now, if this happens, then I have a Kramer law inequality. Uh, I prefer to call it my bias towards Indians, make it a raw Kramer inequality. You would see some books, they write down a Kramer raw inequality. And uh, yeah, so I, I prefer to call it a raw Kramer inequality. So let delta be an unbiased estimator, let delta be an estimator with expected value of delta as g theta. Then under regularity conditions R1, which we know are satisfied for exponential families of distributions, variance of delta would be greater than or equal to g prime theta whole square divided by variance of del by del theta of log of f theta x. So let's try to provide it for any u belonging to u, expect integral over u f theta x dx and integral over delta x f theta dx is equal to g theta can be differentiated under the integral sign, which always happens in the exponential family as I know. Now from Hammersley, Chapman, Robbins inequality, we have a for fixed theta, variance of delta would be greater than or equal to g theta plus delta minus g theta whole square and expected value of this quantity. So, uh, I divide delta on both the sides, numerator and denominator. So g theta delta plus minus g theta by delta whole square. This becomes f theta x minus f theta, f theta plus delta x minus f theta x whole square. And delta square, I'm dividing numerator and denominator both. So it becomes delta over here and f square theta x. I take the limit delta going to zero when I take limit, because this happens for every delta belonging to B theta. I can take delta going to zero. What do I get? Variance of delta would be greater than or equal to G prime theta whole square divided by one upon F theta X whole square. And what is this? This is a derivative respect to theta of F theta at point X. So F theta prime X by F theta X whole square. It is same as uh, g prime theta whole square divided by expected value of, what is this? Derivative of theta, derivative to theta of log of f theta x. So I've got exactly this inequality, except that I have to prove the quantity in the denominator is in fact variance of del by del theta of log f theta x. So I have to show that this is same as variance of del by del theta of log f theta x. So that would be the case if expected value of del by del theta log f theta x is zero. So let's consider what is expected value of del by del theta log f theta x, which is f theta prime x by f theta x into f theta x dx, which is integral over f theta prime x, which is the derivative of f theta x with respect to theta. But I've assumed those regularity conditions hold, that means the derivative and integral signs can be interchanged. So this comes outside and becomes integral over f theta x dx. But this quantity is one because it is a density. So that becomes zero. So I have this remark, suppose that assumptions of last theorem are satisfied and for some unbiased estimator delta naught of g theta, 
variance of delta naught is same as this lower bound, then I know that for any other unbiased emitter, variance would be bigger than this. So that means for that estimator, the variance is minimum, so the data naught would be UMV. So any estimator, any unbiased estimator which attains the lower bound of Kramer raw inequality, or raw Kramer inequality, would be the UMV. Now let's see what is this quantity in the which is a variance of derivative of log of f theta x. Does this quantity have some interpretation? Because what I'm saying is, what I'm saying, what I'm seeing is, if this quantity is small, then variance is going to be large. So let's try, try to see what is it. And in certain sense, then that means in many cases, the minimum variance and bias estimator would have a larger variance if this quantity is small, variance is small. So let's try to see what is an interpretation of the derivative of log of f theta x respect to theta, which is one upon f theta x by del by del theta of f theta x. Now, what is this? This is the rate at which the density changes with respect to theta at point x. So this can be treated as a relative rate. Relative means total is f theta, and this is the change. So relative rate at which the density f theta x changes at x. So I theta, which is expected value of del by del theta log f theta x whole square, which is same as variance of del by del theta log f theta x, this is the average rate of change of density. So the larger value of I theta naught indicates that the density is changing very rapidly. If density changes very rapidly, then it is very easy to distinguish it from its neighborhood, from its neighboring point. So the large value of I theta naught indicates that it is easier to distinguish theta naught from neighboring values of theta because your density is changing very fast around theta naught. And therefore, more accurately, theta can be estimated at theta naught. So if this quantity is large, that means you have a more information about the theta, and then it would be easier to estimate theta much better. And that is get justified from here, because if theta is large, variance is large, this quantity is small, so lower bound is small. And in many situations, UMV would attain this lower bound. So that means the UMV of variance of UMV is small. Right? So it justifies that way why this quantity is related to information. Now, this I theta, which is expected to low del by del theta log f theta x whole square, which is same as variance of del by del theta of log f theta x, is called the Fisher information that x contains about the parameter theta. And it varies as theta varies on the parameter space. Now, under the regularity conditions R1, we have seen that expected value of del by del theta log x theta x is zero. So average relative rate change is zero. And I theta, which is same as variance of del by del theta log x theta x, is same as expected value of del by del theta of log f theta x whole square. Just now we saw that over here. Expected value of zero. So this becomes just the variance of del by del theta of log of f theta x. Now normally uh, I will try to find uh, this i theta through an alternate way because finding this and taking a square sometimes may be complicated. So I'm interested in some easier expression of I theta or an alternate expression for I theta. So in addition to regularity conditions I R1, so that means you can interchange the integral and derivative sign. The second derivative is to, to 
log of a theta x axis. So that is what my assumption is for every x and theta. An integral over f theta x dx can be differentiated twice by differentiating under the integral sign. Then what I know, I already know that integral over del by del theta log f theta x into f theta x is zero because this is same as f theta prime x by f theta x. So this is same as integral over f theta prime x, which is zero, just now we have seen for every theta. So that means the derivative of this would also be zero for every theta. So I take the derivative. So del by del theta of integral del by del theta of log f theta x, f theta x dx is zero for every theta. My regularity conditions are satisfied. So I take the derivative inside. If I take the derivative inside, that means the derivative of these two quantities I take, when I take the derivative of this, it becomes del square by del theta square, log of theta x, f theta x, dx. Then there would be a plus sign. This remains as it is, and del by del theta of f theta x. So del by del theta of log of theta x, this remains as it is, and f theta prime x, dx. What is this? Expected value of del square, del theta square of log of theta x is same as, I here divided by f theta x, and multiply by f theta x. If I divide by f theta x, it becomes expected value of this square with f theta x. So it becomes minus expected value of del by del theta of log f theta x whole square. So what I've done over here is I have divided f theta x prime x by f theta x into f theta x. But this is same as del by del theta of log f theta x. So this square into density, which becomes expected value of this quantity. So I theta, which is expected value of del by del theta log of theta x whole square, can also be sometimes obtained as by just taking the double derivative of log of f theta x with respect to theta, taking expected value and just negating it with a sign minus, you get the I theta. So you can get I theta through this, you can get I theta through this. Okay. So let's try to see what happens then you have exponential family. Yes, any doubts anybody has? So let's see what is happening in the exponential family. So suppose X has a PDF PMF, which is parameterized like this, eta theta TX minus beta into HX. X belongs to sample space, theta belongs to capital theta. So this belongs to exponential family. My assumption is I have parameterized this family in such a way that my main parameter theta is an expected value of t of x. And my also assumption is theta contains an interval in R. So these are mean value parameterization so that my theta is the expected value of the statistic t. If this happens, then I theta is same as one upon variance. So smaller is the variance of t, larger is the information about theta. So in exponential care family, i theta has a very convenient form, which is one upon variance of t. Now for exponential families, one can see, for example, you can look at the book by Lehman, regularity conditions R1 are satisfied. Moreover, for every x belonging to x, log f theta x is twice differentiable, and integral over f theta x dx can be differentiated twice, so that your i theta is minus expected value of minus del square by del theta square log f theta x. So my i theta, that way becomes variance of del by del theta log f theta x, which is expected value of del by del theta log f theta x whole square, which is also same as minus of expected value of del square del theta square of log of theta x. So let us try to compare these quantities one by n because what I, have, what I have to show is variance of t is one upon i theta. So I need to calculate what is the variance of t. For that, I take the log of this f theta x, which is eta theta tx minus b theta plus log of hx. 
So it becomes eta theta tx minus b theta plus log of hx. I take the derivative of log of f theta x. That becomes eta prime theta into tx minus beta prime theta, which becomes I take eta prime theta outside tx minus b, b prime b prime theta by eta prime theta. So my i theta is expected value of this square, which is eta prime theta whole square into expected value of tx minus b prime theta upon eta prime theta whole square. So my a theta turns out to be this quantity. So if I can show that this is same as one upon variance of this quantity, I am done. But note that total integral has to be one. So that means integral over eta theta tx minus bit theta dx has to be one for every theta. So that means this derivative has to be zero. So when I take the derivative, I take the derivative inside, that becomes the density as it is, f theta x, then the derivative of eta theta tx minus b theta, which is eta prime theta, tx minus b prime theta, f theta x dx is zero. What do I get from here? This eta prime theta comes outside, so it is integral over tx f theta x, which is expected value of tx, eta prime theta I have taken over here, and then this is b prime theta integral over f theta x, which is b prime theta. But I have done my p parameterization in such a way that expected value of tx is same as theta. So that means my bit prime theta upon eta prime theta has to be same as theta. This is expected value of tx. If that is the case, my i theta becomes eta prime theta whole square into variance of tx because expected value of tx is b prime theta upon eta for every theta belonging to theta. And Since this quantity is theta, I can differentiate it. So that means eta prime theta whole square, eta prime theta b double prime theta minus eta prime theta, eta double prime theta into b prime theta. This would be same as one. So now I see from star, integral eta prime theta tx minus beta prime theta f theta x is zero. So I differentiate once more this quantity star because derivative would be again zero. So when I differentiate, so that means this as it is differential of this. When I differential of this, I do it f theta x comes and then a theta, eta prime theta tx minus b prime theta comes. So that comes this is square into f theta x, then I take this as a function and derivative of this, that is eta prime theta tx minus beta b double prime theta, f theta dx is zero for every theta. Here eta prime theta comes outside, so that becomes tx minus b prime theta upon eta prime theta whole square into f theta x, plus eta double prime theta into f theta x, along with tx gives me expected value of tx, minus b double prime theta integral of theta x is one, so minus b double prime theta. So this implies that eta prime theta whole square, this is same as expected value of tx, we have just seen that. Expected value of tx is same as b prime theta upon eta prime theta, which is same as theta. So tx, f theta x tx plus eta double prime theta. Expected of tx is same as theta, which is same as beta prime b prime theta upon eta prime theta, minus b double prime theta is same as zero. So eta prime theta whole square variance of tx minus eta prime theta becomes over and eta prime theta, b double prime theta, minus b prime theta, a double prime theta 
is equal to zero. So that means theta prime theta whole square variance of Tx minus theta prime theta is zero because of this equation A, where I've got theta prime theta, beta double prime theta minus theta double prime theta, beta prime theta upon theta prime theta is same as theta prime theta. So this would be same as theta prime theta. So this becomes theta prime theta is equal to zero. So variance of Tx becomes one upon eta prime theta. What does that mean? That means I theta, which I will calculate it as eta prime theta whole square, expected value of Tx minus. So I have calculated I theta as this quantity already over here, eta prime theta whole square into variance of Tx. And we have seen that eta prime theta is same as one upon variance of Tx, it becomes one upon variance Tx whole square, so it becomes one upon variance of Tx. So if your exponential family has mean value parameterization, so that means it is in this form and your parameter theta is such that expected value of Tx is theta, then I theta would always be same as one upon variance of the statistic. So all those Poisson, binomial, and all that you can get from here. Now let uh, theta uh, be a function of some other parameter eta. And let the information contained in the sample about eta is denoted by I star eta. So I try to see a relation between I theta and I star eta. I theta is the information in X contained about theta. I star eta is information in X contained about this eta. Now note that if H is differentiable, then information contained in X about eta would be by definition del by del eta of log of F theta X whole square, which would be same as by Leibniz rule del by del theta log F theta X into del theta by del eta whole square. But this is H prime eta because theta is H eta. So this is H prime eta. So H prime eta whole square comes outside and it is expected value of this square, which is I theta. So the two informations are connected through this. That means if theta is equal to H eta, then information in the data about eta is same as H prime eta whole square multiplied by the information in X about theta. So this is the rate at which it Theta changes with eta. Now note that this remark under the assumptions of last theorem, Tx is the UMV of expected value of Tx. Therefore, variance Tx is a measure of difficulty of estimating expected value of Tx. Or equivalently, reciprocal of variance of Tx is the measure of ease at which theta can be estimated. And this, and in this case, it matches with I theta. So that means if you if you have a large more information I theta, then there is much more ease in estimating theta because variance of T is one upon I theta. So your camera law bound would be related to G prime theta upon one upon I theta kind of a thing. Let us see the, uh, what can you say about information coming independently from various resources? So you have a different random variables which are independent. They all may have certain information about theta. If I sum all of them, my intuition suggests that if these sources of information are independent, then these informations are independent, there is nothing common. So total information should be same as the sum of the all information. And that is what the next theorem says. That let, let Xi have a PDF for PMF F theta I, and let I I theta denote the information contained in Xi about theta I. Assume that X1, X2, Xn are independent. 
and let i theta denote the information contained in the whole sample x1 x2 xn about theta then under regularity conditions r1 the total information contained in this whole sample x1 x2 xn would be the sum of the informations provided these xi's are independent and the proof is straightforward the joint pdf or pmf of x equal to x1 x2 x is f theta x which is product i is equal to 1 to n f theta i xi where f theta i is the pdf of xi they are independent so it is product they may not be identically distributed so i look at log of f theta x which is log of product log of product is same as sum of log i theta would be how much expected value of derivative of this is square so expected value of del by del theta log f theta x whole square which is same as expected value of derivative of this which is summation i is equal to 1 to n del by del theta of log f theta i x i whole square which is same as expected value of this is sum so this is sum of squares del by del theta log f theta i x i whole square plus double sum i not equal to j and log f theta i is coming and log f theta j is coming. So del by del theta log f theta i x i del by del theta log f theta j x for i not equal to j. Okay, so this is same as I can take the expectation inside. So that is summation i is equal to 1 to n expected value of del by del theta log f theta i x i whole square plus summation i not equal to j expected value of del by del theta log f theta i x i into log f theta j x now this quantity i know is i theta so that is summation i is equal to 1 to n i i theta but x i and x j are independent so expected value of this product would be same as product of expectations so this is same as expected value of del by del theta log f theta i x i into expected value of del by del theta log of f theta j x i. But each of them is zero. So this becomes summation i is equal to one to n i i theta. And that is what the result says. So if you have independent exercise, then total information is same as some of the informations. Now, if there were IIDs also, then you know that these II theta, which is expected value of this quantity, since all exercise, if they are have the same distribution, then this all would be same. Sorry, this quantity. Because each XI will have the same distribution. So in that case, it would become simply, simply the n times information contained in the one observation. So under the assumptions of last theorem, let x1, x2, xn be iid, so that i1 theta is same as i2 theta is same as i n theta, which is same as i theta. Uh, let me call this as small i theta. Then the information contained in the whole sample is same as n times i theta. Let me stop over here because I plan to take it for 75 minutes, but uh, uh, I, I understand that a lot of you may be uh, losing the uh, focus. So there's no point in uh, continuing further uh, yeah, because 75 minutes would be too much. One hour is good enough. I've already exceeded five minutes. Yeah, so I, I would stop here. and uh, uh, But I would welcome any questions which uh, uh, any one of you might have. Yes, does anyone has any question? Please try to do these homework problems, which I have done. I'll be giving one more homework. Uh, 
uh, today or tomorrow sometime. So try to do these homework problems. We can discuss it sometime uh, next week. So all those, uh, just one sec, let me just. So try to do those homework problems. Uh, we'll discuss it sometime next week. We can have uh, additional session of tutorial if required. Uh, but it would be useful if you go through those homeworks. So if anyone has any doubts, uh, he may stay back, others may leave. And then we'll meet on Monday for our next lecture. Okay, if there are uh, no questions, uh, let me call off uh, today's session. Rosan, do you have anything? Rosan, can I, can you hear me? Okay, let me call off. It looks like Rosan came and just switched on his camera and just vanished. Okay.